Well, if I've heard these two questions once, I've heard them a hundred times this past year. Has there ever been such a time like this? And is there any hope for the future? With the current cultural convulsion, the cultural acceleration, we're observing the disregard for law, for corruption at the highest levels, for open and celebrated uh, immorality. We have parades for immorality now. Uh, dire economic forecast, a moral compass that isn't in the wrong direction, it's just spinning, <laughs> just spinning. Have there ever been a time like this? The second question, is there any hope for the future? How do we recover from this mess? Where is the hope? Well, at times like these, we read us some book of Judges. And so that's where we're going to be for the next six weeks. The book of Judges talks about a time in Israel's history where they spiraled downward into rebellion against God that left their culture and their personal lives devastated in a mess. The book is saturated with toxic events, betrayal, genocide, killings, human sacrifice, slaughter, slavery, scandal, vile degradation. It's known to be the worst book of the Bible if it wasn't for hearing about the death of Christ in the New Testament. Some passages can't be read publicly, but we ask the question, where is hope? It was a mess back then. Where is hope? So we'll take a six-week journey looking at what we call the cycle of judges. How sin brings consequences, yet the mercy and love of God is never far off. We learn that the Bible isn't a rule book. The Bible is a love letter. It's the story of God's heart for his people. So we're going to start in Judges, but the book actually starts in Joshua chapter 1. That's where we start, in Joshua 1. Joshua 1, 6. You remember Joshua is called, and he's told to be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. A promise from God. So the people of Israel had fallen into sin. They had been taken into captivity in Egypt. Moses brings them out of captivity. And as they're going out of captivity from Egypt, the Passover is celebrated. It's a miracle that God delivers them from the Egyptian army. They get to Mount Sinai where God gives Moses a covenant. The Ten Commandments. Obey these and I will bless you. It will go well with you. There's five covenants in the New Testament, or, well, you could say seven, but we'll look at five. The Noahic covenant is the first one. Noah, God said, I will never destroy the earth again by water, and the sign I'm giving you is the rainbow. Ah, we love to see the rainbow. It's a sign of God's promise. And then we had the Abrahamic covenant, where God told Abraham, I am going to give you a land, a nation, a name, and a blessing. Abraham had no children at the time. But God did that through Isaac. And the children of Israel just swelled to a large population. But then they sinned, taken into captivity in Egypt. And then we have the Mosaic Covenant on the Mount Sinai. God tells Moses through the, through the people. He says, obey this covenant. And if you obey it, you will be a holy kingdom of priests. That's my promise to you. And so they're on the verge of that. They're leaving Egypt. They're going to find the land, the promised land that Abraham was promised. Because God always keeps his promises. And as they go, they go and it takes 40 years, you remember. Because when they got to the, the land, Moses sent in 10 spies. Two of them were Joshua, Caleb. Ten of them are named, but we don't talk about them. Because they came and said, we can't take the land. Joshua and Caleb said, we can. But because they didn't, God had them wander for 40 years in the wilderness till that whole generation <coughs> died off. And now Joshua is back there at the Jordan River. He's ready to go in. God has given him a covenant. He said in verse 6 of 1 of Joshua, you will take this land. That's my covenant. You will have this land. 
In Joshua 1, 7 through 9, he says, Be strong and courageous, God tells him. Be careful to obey my commandments. Do not turn from the right or the left, that you may be successful in whatever you do. Keep this book of the law. Always keep it on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And God was. They went into the land. The first city, remember, was Jericho. Oh, great Sunday school story. They marched around Jericho seven for seven days. The walls fall down. They take Jericho. And then they take all the southern cities. And then they take all the northern cities. And then as they've taken most of the land, God does something wonderful in Joshua chapter 14. The last part of taking the land is with a guy named Caleb. You remember him? He was the one who said, let's go. The whole generation has died out except Joshua and Caleb. In Joshua 14, verse 10, Caleb pops up and he says, Now then, just as the Lord has promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel was moved about the wilderness. So here's 85. Caleb says, So here I am today, he tells Joshua, 85 years old. I am still strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill. <laughs> I want one more hill. And Moses said, okay. So he took the next hill at 85, strong. It reminded me of my father who was um, diagnosed with melanoma at 82. And he said, the doctor said, here's the treatment. Here's what you have to do. And he said, no, I got one more trip to China. I'm going back. I've got one more hill, and he did take that final hill. So that was Caleb, and that was the greatest generation, the ones that went in and took the land. In verse twenty or chapter 24 of Joshua, verse 31, Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Not the generation that didn't go in, they died. The generation that went in, they were the greatest generation. They had taken the land. They had godly leadership. They were told to keep the law and everything will go well. They were given a charge that you will show the nations the glory of God because I am with you. I'll be with you in the tabernacle. I'll be with you in the temple. They will see your faithfulness to me and they will be changed. And the book of Judges comes next. And it talks about the time they get in to the time we start with the kings. There's a period of hundreds of years of judges where things did not go as planned. The book of Judges depicts the life of Israel. But Israel adopted and embraced all the evil practices in the land. Oh, they had it set up for success. They had everything they needed. Everything for life and godliness. Remember that verse from the New Testament? But they turned away. One commentator said, Many have noticed that Judges isn't merely bad. It gets worse and worse throughout the book. And by the time you get to the end, even Sodom and Gomorrah's famed sins, which resulted in fire and brimstone, those sins pale in comparison to Israel's sin in Judges 19, which is punctuated by God's notable absence. Something happens in Judges where they start down a wrong path and it's a cycle that gets deeper and deeper. They chose to disobey. In Judges chapter 1, verse 4, it starts good. When Judah attacked, they're attacking the first city, the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands. Now someone would say, hey, why are God's people attacking other people and killing them? Well, what's that about? Well, the Canaanites were the descendants of Ham. Remember, Noah had three sons, and one was Ham. The descendants of Ham were Canaanites, and they were just not good pe people. Their society was punctuated with idolatry and rampant child sacrifice. It was just a horrible situation. 
It was a culture that couldn't be changed. And God said, wipe all of them out. This is your land. That's hard for us to understand. Why would God do that? Doesn't God love everybody? Absolutely does. I can't answer that. But this is what God did. I have chosen a people that are going to redeem generations of people. And you have to wipe them out. So Judah did. And then in verse 8, they went ahead and kept going. The men of Judah attacked Jerusalem. They took it. They put the city to sword and set it on fire. So they were on a roll. They were going through. They were doing exactly what God said. But then we get to verse 19. Only 19 verses in. The Lord was with the men of Judah. They took possession of the hill country. But they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron, which were bigger than God. Probably not. But they didn't do it. And then in verse 21, we see what happened. The Benjamites, however, did not drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. Verse 27, but Manasseh did not drive out the people in their area. Each tribe was given a portion of Israel to take over, to build up wonderful cities, temples that would glorify God. Manasseh didn't do it. Never drove them out completely. Verse 29, nor did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, neither did Zebulun drive out the Canaanites. We got a pattern here. Verse 31, nor did Asher drive out those living in Akko and Sidon. In fact, they made them slaves. Verse 33, neither did Naphtali drive out those living in Beth Shemesh. Verse 34, the Amorites confined the Danites to the hill country. That's my people, the Danites. <laughs> the tribe of Dan. They didn't allow them to come down to the plain. None of the children of Israel, none of the tribes, obeyed God. They repeated failure on a grand national scale. And so God responds in chapter 2 of Judges. Verse 1, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Boykim and said, you didn't know there was a town named Boykim. He said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you to the land I swore to give your ancestors. I kept my promise. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? Why have you done it? He summarizes in verse 10. God does. He said, a whole generation had been gathered to the ancestors. This was the greatest generation. And another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israels did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served Baal. That's only the first two chapters. <laughs> they disobeyed God. They did not know the God of their fathers. I think that's one of the powerful movements of the legacy coalition of grandparents is calling grandparents to not happen what happened here where the kids did not know God. The grandkids did not know God. Some people walk away. Some kids walk away. God gives completely free will. But at least they walk away knowing there was a God. There was a God who was living. Mm. I think of Good Friday where Ron gave his testimony. He was 22 years old. And he said he knew that there was a God. And he thought he had a son named Jesus, but that's all he knew. <laughs> ah, our kids should know much more and those around us. Well, a disturbance, violent, violent consequences come from choosing to live like the world. And the repeated phrase in Judges you'll hear is every man did that which was right in his own eyes. You've heard that before. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so we get to this cycle of judges. You see it there printed on the back page. It's a cycle of five things that happen when people enter, enter sin. We see it in judges, we see it throughout history, and we may even see it in our own lives. First, there's sin that happens. We reject God. And then God gives a clear, obedient, 
direction, you'll be blessed? No. The children of Israel said no. In the Old Testament, if you chose to choose God, the blessings from God were material. It was family, it was cows, it was sheep, it was land. In the New Testament, you choose to follow God, and the blessings are treasures we lay up in heaven. It's a new covenant, because there's two more covenants coming after the Noahic, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, there's the Davidic, and the new covenant. The new covenant is not that if you trust God, all of a sudden, you're going to live in your Belinda, or Bella, or wherever. No, you trust God, and you start storing up blessings in heaven. So instead of that, they sinned, and then suffering came. The primary message of Judges is that God will not allow sin to go unpunished. In the book of Judges, we clearly observe that life is messy, it's foul, it's complicated, and that the cycle of our own sin creates these problems. So they sin, they cry out, to, they suffer, and then they cry out to God. Supplication, we had to do four, five S's. Supplication, they cry out, and which is the most comforting truth in Scripture. It's found in Psalm 34. The righteous cry and God hears. <laughs> that is so comforting. The righteous cry, God hears, and then God brings a judge. They have salvation. A judge comes and rescues them. And the covenant of faithfulness to the Lord, an amazing, patience, loving God, is demonstrated through salvation. God brings a Savior, an imperfect Savior, as you'll see, because the perfect Savior is coming. They have salvation, and then there's a period of silence where the land rests for a while. In that time of salvation, not only God brings a judge, but his Holy Spirit. It's interesting, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit doesn't reside with people permanently. The Holy Spirit comes upon people. So as we look at the judges, we'll see that they, God called them, put the Spirit on them, they did wonderful things, and then the Spirit leaves. In the New Testament, after Acts, when Jesus leaves, the Spirit comes upon us, permanently. He indwells us. We are to be filled with the Spirit. So it's a different covenant, but that's the cycle. We see it right in chapter 3. The first whole cycle in four verses. Chapter 3, verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. Right? That's their sin. They forgot the Lord their God. They served the Baals and the Asherahs. Idols. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of the Cusharashathim, king of Aram Naharim. So there's the suffering. God saw that they sinned, raises up a king, takes them into captivity. What happens in verse 9? They cried out to the Lord and he raised up a deliverer, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge, went to war. The Lord gave the Cush and Rithanaim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel died. You see the cycle right there? Sin, suffering, supplication, salvation, silence, peace. Not shalom, peace. It's interesting. It said there was just a calmness, a quietness in the land. People weren't really looking to God. Look at, there's another cycle right in verse 12. Ehud, the good judge, another good judge. Against the Israelites, again the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. And because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, the king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel and they took possession of the city of the palms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. Sin, here's the suffering. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Gern, a Benjamite. Any left-handed people there? See, Ehud's your man, right? The only left-handed judge we have in the, in the, in the Bible. A left-handed man. God raised up Ehud. The people cried. Ehud delivers them. We're not going to read this story. It's just way too graphic. 
But in verses 28 is the end of the story. Follow me, Ehud said, for the Lord has given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They followed one no one to cross over. And at that time they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous, all strong, not one escaped. And that day Moab was made subject to Israel and the land had peace for 80 years. Wow. Wow. Sin. Suffering, supplication, salvation, silence. You would think, wow, they got it. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. And again, Israel did what? Evil in the sight of the Lord. Right? It goes on and on. Well, chapter 4 and 5 and 6 is a story of another judge that we're going to talk about next week. The judge, Deborah. But the theme of judges is this downward spiral of their national guilt, their spiritual life, chaos, rebellion. The point here is dark but simple. As people move away from obeying God, things get dark and darker. Inevitably results in treating other people <laughs> less than human. Chaotic injustice. It reminds me of Romans chapter 1. You know that passage. You read it and you go, wow, didn't they learn their lesson? No, here's what Romans 1 says from verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth. Since they may have known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Intelligent design. People know there is a God. Intuitively. For although they knew God. Romans 1.21 says. They neither glorified him. As God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise. They became fools. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God. For images made to look like mortal human beings, birds and animals, reptiles. Therefore God gave them over the spiral to sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served and created, created things rather than the creator. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. The same way men also abandoned natural relations with women, were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they not should be done. They have become with they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, and that's just the nightly news. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity. No love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, they approve of those who practice them. They give them likes on Facebook. That's what it says. Mm. Judges talks to us about this cycle that happens of depravity that goes on and on. So where's the hope? Are things as bad as they've always been? Where's the hope? Here's five or six sermons we're going to give in the next six weeks. The first one is God keeps his promises. God told Adam, I'm going to raise up people. He told Noah, I'm not going to destroy. Noah, I'm not going to destroy. Abraham, I'm going to give you a land. Moses, I'm going to give you a law. God always keeps his promises. 
Davidic covenant. I'm going to give you a king from your, from your generation. And then secondly, the new covenant. Anyone who trusts in Christ can have eternal life. That's the new covenant. So the most shocking feature about the book of Judges is not the horror and the depravity of sin. It's that God saves. God is there. God is watching. He's full of patience, mercy, compassion, steadfast love, faithfulness. He lets many of us go down a path of sin. <laughs> but he's always at the end. Always calling us back. We have children, we have family that's gone away. Their story's not done yet. <laughs> They're walking away. But God's watching. He's patient. He's merciful. God keeps his promises. You can't break God's promises by leaning on them. <laughs> I learned that this week as I was, Suzanne was sitting in the loft and I walked by and we started a conversation. I didn't want to sit down, but the ironing board was right there. So I decided to lean on the ironing board. <laughs> Shaboosh, right? It all went down on the ground. But we don't break God's promises by leaning on them. Yeah, it's out in the backyard in the trash already. <laughs> God keeps his promises. The second thing next week is God hears his people. God hears his people. Every time they cry out, he hears. We'll learn that through the story of Deborah, a female judge that God raises up. Third week, God wins the battle. God wins the battle. It's a story of Gideon who thought he could do it with a lot of men, but he only does it with a few because God wins the battle. The story is not over yet. Fourth week is God redeems. God redeems. They get into a situation and God raises up a judge. You would never think this guy would be a judge. He was a, not a good situation. But God said, I'm going to redeem your life. The son of a prostitute. And God raises him to be a judge. God redeems our stories. God redeems bad things. The fifth week, God is strong in our weakness. All the judges were broken saviors. We taught our kids these stories of Deborah and Samson and Jephthah. And the, but these guys didn't do good at the end of life. They took another turn at the end. They were imperfect saviors. They all point to a perfect savior that was to come. Again, these human heroes reveal that salvation comes from God's initiative, not man's. These were great men. These were men that God picked. The sixth one is God has a plan for a savior. He worked through these judges that will point us eventually to Jesus Christ. The story of judges. Has there been a worse time? Oh, there has. Is there still hope? Yes. Is there still hope? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Well, today, fortunately, we don't engage in a holy war like the Israelites did. Jesus, God doesn't call us to go kill a bunch of people. That was a shadow. The reality is, today is the common struggle we face against the forces of darkness that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. We are to be courageous. We are to be people of hope. We are to be people on mission. We do not have to fear. We can be like Joshua. Be strong. And be courageous. Are we ready to do it? Yes. Of course we are. Let's pray. So Father we do thank you. In the midst of yuck. In the midst of stupid. In the midst of blindness. In the midst of following our passions down into dark areas. You redeem. And just hearing about all this could bring up a lot of stuff for us in this room. Because we've all done stuff. So we want to not be trapped by that. But thank you for your grace. Your mercy. Your forgiveness. Help us to focus on the hope you have. And many of us have family and friends. Who are walking in the dark path. Father give us hope for them. Help us to pray for them. Intercede for them. Advocate for them. Because you do. You do. Help us as we go through this, Father, to look at our culture, not in a judgmental way, but with passion and compassion. 
and a heart to love people and to share the good news of Jesus Christ that was shared to us. We thank you we can have hope. In the midst of the day that we live, we are people of hope, for you are a great God. How great you are. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.